I'm so delighted to welcome onto the First Time Facilitator podcast, Michael Grinder. Michael, thank you so much for joining us today. Pleasure. It's so funny when I work with teams across the world, uh, big teams, small teams, all I hear from them when I work, because they call me because they need help. And I say, oh, what do you need help with? And the answer is always communication. Yeah. I don't know if anyone else, um, we've got the members of the Virtually Possible community on the call. Yeah. What I love about what you've done is you've created a model where you deconstruct communication so you can actually be quite specific on areas that you should target. But before we jump into that model, the house of communication, can you share with our listeners a bit about your story, how what really sort of led you down the path of exploring and diving deep into the world of communication? Well, my first career was as a teacher. And so if you don't have relationship, you have nothing. It's not content. A high school level, I uh, worked a lot with dropouts that uh, were either above or below the IQ level, and you had to reach both of them. So I just found that being in a sequestered situation called a classroom, you know if you're doing well or if you're not doing well. And whatever you do, you're going to see them again tomorrow. So be honest, be real, be sincere. So that's where I started off communication in general. And then the family joke is, since my brother John is the co-founder of NLP, and it's such a great verbal model, why go into that area? So I went into nonverbals, but it's a family joke. It's not true. <laughs> Very uh, successful family. Wow, you've just like dominated the world with your two different <laughs> ways of looking at things. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so nonverbal, that's, I guess, and let's bring it right into virtual right now. Something about this group is that the tagline is, we think it is possible to recreate the magic of face-to-face -face experiences online. What do you think about that? How are you finding the virtual world and communicating um, as opposed to the joy that we all have with being in person? You know, Mark said something on a previous broadcast that you had that I thought was so important. It's two-dimensional. So it's, it's hard to get three-dimensional. And so with two-dimensional, you're limited in terms of what you do. What I'm finding as I reflect on distance learning in general, what are the aspects of distant learning that I can't get one-on-one, -on -one, person to person? And maybe I should emphasize that. So I do not try to compete with myself when I'm in front of people live, because I know what I can do there. So then I'm, instead of competing, I go, what is different that I can really utilize? Number one is it's an ongoing, if I see them week by week, which I can't do if I'm doing a one day to a five day to a 10 day training, they don't have any time to implement. So I spend a lot of time saying, okay, here's our topic for today. Here's a worksheet that you can fill out as we go along. And then here's your reflections implementations to do between now and next time. And I'm moving more and more towards, if you're gonna sign up for the course, you have to become a member of a cohort. And the cohorts get together and they do their sharing of what they're learning and they have to actually post it up on a forum. That, the advantage of the distant learning, we've got to embrace it. Let's go for it. Oh yes, I love that motivation. Um, and I think a key thing that I picked up from that, love to hear from my, my co-hosts on this is, that whole competition against yourself. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, because we're all like, I need to make this as great as it was. It's like, no, no, but you're saying it's different. But I think there's something else, if I may, that um, I don't know if you've seen, but I recommend if you haven't, it's called A Social Dilemma. And it talks about, yes, yes. It talks about how addictive the electronic world is. And it, you're just doing stimuli after stimuli. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people go, how can I bring more energy to what I'm doing? I'm going, I don't want to compete with that. I'm not looking for people that are going down electronic rabbit holes and bump into my website. Not interested. I want people that are there because they know why they want to be there, not because they're visiting. So I just disregard at least half the population and saying, I'm not interested. I want people that are have a absolute desire to learn, not to be entertained. Whoa, this is great. Because a lot of the time I, I, I personally think that I, like Leanne Hughes is in a battle versus Netflix versus, yeah. Yeah. and it's like, how can I possibly win that? <laughs> I'm not going to cry. 
Yeah. And, and the reason I guess I started my own business was Michael had often run training for, for corporates and, you know, the, the people that are there just, they're, they're being dragged in to be there. So they're sort of sitting like that. And I was like, I just want to work with people that want to be part of this. And so yep. it's just a joy to see people on, live on the call as well that have, yeah, you want to work with people that want to learn. Absolutely. Um, if you're listening to this on the podcast, you can't see Michael and his ah. gestures. So I recommend watch it. Yeah, you can watch the video later. But it sort of leads into a question about that house of communication. And you talk about the importance of nonverbal. It's what you're all about. Uh, now, everyone on the screen, we can only see from what just basically our, our necks up. Um, your, I can see your hands, you're raising them, which is a good reminder to myself. Yep. What are we losing or how can we bring elements of nonverbal into this world? Even when I talk to you right now, I'm looking down my camera. I'm not looking at you, Michael. Um, yeah. yeah. So what are you finding with that? One of the things I want someone to invent um, by this weekend, maybe um, Leanne Elliott will do it and send it over to me. I want to have a, a camera eye that I can <laughs> float in the middle of my computer screen. So I can see the content and I'm looking directly at, so if I look at my content, it doesn't look like I'm looking at you. If I look <laughs> at you, I can't see my content. How do we put those two together? So I think we just need to work on it. One of the things I'm going to is Ecom, e and I have two cameras. So that if I want to stand up, I switch on a actual uh, little box I have and I go to a second camera. So then I can stand up and do a flip chart, post it, whatever I want, and people can still see me eye to eye. So how do you say eye to eye? That's big. I think that's huge. And it's one of the key things in your model as well, eye contact. So it mm -hmm. is huge. So do you think we're losing, um, we're losing much from that? Like the fact that we can't do the eye contact. So yeah, we can get tech. But uh, actually, I'll be keen to hear. I don't know if anyone wants to come off mute and share like how they're balancing eye contact. Martin, you raised your hand before. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I coach one to one by, uh, by video and on a number of different platforms on Zoom and on internal organizational platforms. And, and it's a bend of my life is this not making eye contact. I feel very uncomfortable because I make, I make eye contact in, in situations, for example, if someone speaks to me and I'm not yep. do, and I'm doing something, I'll say, let me finish this and I'll turn. So making eye contact is really important to me. So I end up with you, I'm pointing now, but you're in a tiny little square about this big, yeah. right yeah. next to where my camera is at the top of the screen. And I'm yeah. doing my best to make sure I can see you because I need the feedback from you. And I also want you to know that I'm looking at you, which is bizarre. So I've got to look a little bit higher where the camera is, just look green light and do the best I can. But it's so frustrating. You're absolutely right, Michael. I have worked and pondered on this for months about <laughs> how to this camera I've even thought about blue tacking a camera in the middle of the screen. Yes. It's a sort of, uh, as we would, do, I don't know if you remember this, Michael, or know the name, but my dad used to say it's a Heath Robinson uh, job. So basically, you stick things together and make them work with a bit of string and something and hope for the best. But <laughs> we're getting there. But one, one day, someone will do this, Michael, and I'll be there right with you buying the second one. Yep. Yep. The, I think the other answer to the question, how do we compensate? because I think that's part of the question we're asking, is I've been blessed to have in a family of nine children, second born. The last one was uh, hearing impaired. And so we watched her grow up because she was the baby of the family. And she went to a deaf university as her master's degree. And one of the things we find is if you take away one of the senses, you develop the other sense. So one of the things that we're learning with distance learning is, hey, you've got to pay attention differently than you used to. And one of the ways to do that is my sister Jenny, uh, years ago, they had the first electronic game was on your television, it was called Pong. And you played the 15. <laughs> well, my sister would sit there and she'd wait until it was 14 to zero. Then she'd finally touch the remote and she'd start and she'd beat you 15 to 14. And I kept going, this is not fair. Her calling her handicap. I'm going, really? Yeah, yeah. I, I don't understand that. And I did an experiment one year when I was teaching high school and I had a particularly smart group of seniors that are ready to graduate. They're all, most of them are gonna go to university. And I thought, how do I help them understand the rest of the world 
before they graduate. And what I did was I found that in the library, we had these beautiful uh, laminations of uh, classic paintings and they were reflective for protective coating. So I made the seniors walk around for three days and they had to walk from one class to another. They could not see where they were going. They had to look at the reflection off of it. And it made them so humble in terms of understanding, hey, so even when I work with people that I call my process level, so if people have come to a class and they're gonna return, what do they do? I recommend that they buddy up and what they do is for 10 minutes in the morning, 10 minutes in the afternoon, sitting next to their buddy, they poke them and they indicate, I'm gonna close my eyes and listen. When does the speaker, in this case, it happens to be me raise or lower the voice. When do we go to a whisper? How does that happen? And so just, if you just change your input structure, the other thing is 10 minutes morning, 10 minutes in the afternoon, they have to wear earbuds and they cannot hear anything because they're listening to music. All they can do is see. So what do you see when you take away your ears? What do you see when you take away your eyes? And you can do that with TED Talks on YouTube. Mm. Yeah. And that's, I think, um, just before we hit record, I was saying to Michael just why I love podcasts and how I find the medium so intimate. I find it more intimate just listening to a podcast than even watching a video of an interview because I can be in my own space and in my own time and it's just coming through my ears. And I think that really elevates. So, yeah, absolutely good point there. If we can't, if eye contact is failing, well, how can we boost up things like audio and then manage our voice? Now, voice is for a podcaster, one of the most important things, one of the hardest things was to do to even start a podcast was like having to listen to myself. Yeah. Um, and also Australians, and I do it all the time, Michael, like we always end with an inflection, like everything's a question. I, I'm trying to stop that. But what is, yeah, for, for first time facilitators that when we know that now voice is really critical, it's why I have this uh, retro microphone. Uh, how can we get better at using, utilizing our voice? It's a very what open question. One of the things I do is, you were asking me in one of your notes, what do I do a week before, a day before, an hour before? I have a little piece of gum and I've broken it off and I put it into my mouth. It's over here in the corner. It activates my salivary glands. So I sound like I have more moisture than I would otherwise. And I do that. Then the other thing I do, especially if I'm doing a phone interview, I will take a pen and put it in my mouth. And what happens is I have a look at held all my muscles in my mouth really enunciate better. So I sound good for the first 15 seconds. So all the little tricks, what are you going to do? You've got to figure out. Otherwise, you go through life saying, I've got to make sure I look good. Come on. There's more than just looks. But for most people, I think the research is, 65% of all the information you take in comes in through your eyes, even if you're not visually oriented. Wow. Okay. Um, <laughs> you talked about looks. I've actually got a lip filter on. <laughs> so I was like, it's 5.30 a.m. I'm not putting on any lipstick. So this is actually a filter <laughs> if you're seeing on the screen. So funny. Um, yeah. On that note, and, and, and even before the call, because yeah, it is so early and I actually, all I did was I sent my friend a voice note um, just on the phone just to warm it up. So I had to respond to her, uh, yeah. but I actually love the idea of gum. Gosh, any hacks are great. Leanne, you've written there, first impression counts. What do you think about that, Michael? Does the first impression really count? It does. And it depends on what the situation is like between you and the other person, what the outcomes are who has higher, lower status? Do you know each other, don't know each other? So in general, if you want, uh, we developed a concept called the five circles of humanness. And the very first thing you notice with someone else is their appearance. And from that, you hallucinate what the person is like. It's faulty, but we all do it. It's called people watching. And your first impression actually is cemented within 40 seconds. If you're with the person and you're interacting, you will eventually move to what their behaviors are like, not their appearance. If you work with them day after day, <clears throat> you'll go into what their styles are like. If you live with them at home, you'll go into their values and then their core identity. So yes, first impression is always appearance. 
it doesn't last too long. And so that's why whatever you look like, if, if you got good stuff, they'll get it. Love that. Uh, and even with the parents, like the, uh, so background is also, I, I just get really curious, like what's some people's backgrounds and I want to know more about them, like sort of step past that first impression and go, what, what does that mean? And why are they choosing to have that in the, in the frame? So I, um, I like here because Mark's comment about that and it's a fella chiseling. And so you have to create your own professional development. Yeah. And Do you want to share, share more about chiseling and professional development? Well, I also have the same thing in a female form. So please, it's not just one gender that gets to do the professional development. And so you have to figure out what do you want? And I normally go with this, and if I may, with due respect to um, Simon Sinek, yes, everything does start with why, but it's gotta continue with how. So I'm a how person. Yeah. Watch Simon and come on over my channel. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> so with the, uh, back to the house of, of communication and the, the third level, and it's funny that um, even, uh, sorry, podcasters shouldn't do this, but I, I keep, continue to do it. I know I shouldn't. I always refer to like the stuff that was the pre-interview and what we spoke about. Uh, but a few things that you did in that, Michael, which to demonstrate your use of your own model was, you know, you, you asked me for permission. And even then you just said, oh, may I, may I. And that's the fourth level. So definitely we'll put a link to your house of communication model um, in the show notes for this. The, Thank you. The part that's really relevant for facilitators, um, well, it's all relevant, but you, you mentioned on the third level group observation. And it's up to us in terms of communication is seeing if we're in a group, what's happening, are things going on track and how do we stay on track? When do we need to intervene or not? And I think that is a critical skill for facility. I mean, everything is in, in the model, but that in particular, it's probably the one that scares us the most is like when I was starting to facilitate, what if the group doesn't want to go down this path? Like, what am I going to do? So what are some things that we can do when things are going off track that are possibly more subtle than saying, right, we're off track, now let's move it on. Yeah, yeah. If we put all strategies in terms of what to do on a continuum from one end being proactive and the other one is reactive. The difference between the art and science is, the science is what do I do if it goes wrong? The art is how do I know it may go wrong and what am I doing to prevent it? So trying to move from the science of facilitation presenting to the art, wow, what a difference. So if you're gonna move from that, what do I do with if, if this happens to, how do I prevent it from happening? Boy, that to me is really something. Example, if I'm presenting and people say, what's the first thing you wanna do, especially they go back to first impression. Most facilitators go as, I wanna come across as credible. I really don't think that's the most important part. Coming across as competent is important, but you can be competent and not credible and you can be credible and not competent. So let's separate those two. Now, if you are competent, then make sure you have a sense before you get in front of the people. So this is early questionnaire with your sponsor. What are they most resistant to? If this is the center of the stage and I start here saying, thank you for coming. And then I walk over here before I start and say, before we begin. And over here, I say whatever they're in, resistant to, I'm not contaminating where I'm gonna present from. So do your acknowledgement of the elephant, get it out, get it out early. Then move back over. And once you get here, oftentimes have amnesia, you ever went there. Whoa. It's a way of being proactive. Yeah, and it just reminds me of um, in high school, I got, first of all, terrible actor here, actress. Um, I did drama. And we had to like, so you read a script and you block where you're going to stand for certain elements. So I guess that's probably the term. If, you, if you're keen on finding out more about this, yeah, I guess, is that what you call it? Blocking where you're going to, blocking elements of the room and yep, moving to yep, stage yep. left. Use of locations. Yeah, it's better than wandering back and forth. Come on. Which you kind, of, kind of do when you get nervous. <laughs> yeah, get all the energy out. No, no, be systematic. Oh, be systematic. Love that. What do I just throw over to um, Mari, Leanne and Martin are all on the call. If you've got any questions, it'd um, be great to, I I've got lots more that I can ask Michael, but I'm keen, this is a group interview. Marie, Mari, sorry, over to you. Um, 
It's a great reminder, Michael, to to think about the spots that we're anchoring when we're face to face. How would you do that virtually? It, you you still can do it, and if you just make sure that you broaden your idea of what how do you anchor, uh, you can anchor by location. That's true, but you're two dimensional when you're distant learning. Yeah. So then you can anchor by your voice, you can anchor by where you look. So there's a variety of ways of doing it. Example. If I was doing a visual activity and I wanted to bring up something that's negative, the rule of thumb in general is eye contact if it's positive, visual to something that is a third point if it's negative. So I could turn this way for those people that are not seeing this. I'm turning to one side and I have something here I can look at. I can then go over to the other side and show something else. I could also take and use different colors. So I may want to use red for negative and green for positive. Yeah. So it's not anchoring or associating with location is only one of many, many, many nonverbals. I love it when people, instead of telling the story, they reenact the story. And you can't do it as well auditorily than you can visually. Example, if I said, when I was a little boy and I looked directly at the audience, then you're the little boy because I gestured towards you. But I could also go like this. When I was a little boy and I turned sideways and I gesture off to the side, then that location is where the little boy was. And I'm either the parent or someone else. Then I can swing around and come over here and go, and I looked up at my father and I changed my voice. I'm now, instead of looking at you, I'm showing you the story. I'm letting you experience it. And as soon as I'm able, and this is the difference between the science and the art of presentation. The science says never break eye contact. The art says break eye contact. Make them come into your reality. And it's as simple as if you have some PowerPoints, <laughs> if you have a PowerPoint and you point to the PowerPoint, but your eyes are still on the audience, you're gonna put your audience in a bind. Because socially, do they look at you because you're looking at them or do they follow your hand? Why don't you make sure that all hand gestures are accompanied by eyes? Then you're gonna find it just makes it easier. And then if you wanna get really good, if you are gonna show something digitally right next to your face, please don't look at the audience and show something. You're overwhelming their brain. If you're gonna show something, turn your body and look at it. Now, whichever hand is dominant, that's the hand you wanna to point to, why? Because if I take and point with my hand, I will turn my body towards what I'm looking at. And now both my eyes and my hands are in the same location. Whereas if I have something and I have my hand not closest to the audience and I go like this, I have a tendency to look at the audience. So always point with your dominant hand across your body and your eyes and hands are reinforcing what is the focus that you want the audience to be at. That is amazing. I don't know. I've done um, interviews with people in person where there's been a camera. And so you're like, do I look at the person? Do I look at the camera? So that was, that's always been my, like, where do I go? Usually I try to focus on the person and if it's natural turn to the camera, but I never, like, honestly, it's the first time I've thought about that in the context of facilitating and, and sharing pieces. And I love that you talked, because I talk about contrast a lot in workshops and how we can mix up the contrast. It's yeah. exactly what you're talking about in terms of the different sides, oh. the voice. I mean, you can even have fun with this. You know, if you're telling something that's pretty dark, you could put some like music in the background to set up the story. And now, wow, well, you've opened up so many possibilities. Sure. Thank you. Leanne, yeah. I think you had a question uh, to follow. Um, thank you, Leanne. And the joy was that my question was exactly the same as Mari's question. And, and now uh, about, you know, that, that idea of the elephant in the room and, and I can't walk across anymore. <laughs> yeah. And, and I, I loved how you beautifully did it with your hands, especially marked the elephant with your hands. And I was like, ah, oh, let's talk a bit about how I can lift my stagecraft up mm -hmm. off. I've got, I've no longer got my feet. <laughs> what, what am I doing to lift that? How can yeah. I, I still do my stagecraft where I'm placing 
my control points, placing my, you know, my elephant in the room points, placing my intimate story points. Um, I, I no longer have that ability to do that. I suppose the other question that I'm carrying as well is a bit around, um, it, Michael, you mentioned before the group dynamic issue where it's when I'm in the room it's so easy to see what's happening and to to sense how's the group traveling and are they all together and are we moving along and where are we placed and I lose a lot of that with the zoom meetings you know and I can see people but I, I can't sense them anymore and I'm wondering about how you feel, or what, what have you experienced um, in managing the group dynamic and sensing how they're traveling and how they're moving, um, whether they need more time for something or mm -hmm. it's time to move on? Mm -hmm. you know, what, what is it that's shifted in the virtual environment for you? Oh, my goodness, has it ever, Leanne. Uh, Tina Fey is one of my many heroes in life. And she said in an interview, she said, if you really want to do well uh, in movies, you have to make sure you always return to theater because theater is live. And if you do a gesture, you say a line, you need to make sure you've memorized how long you hold that pause for them to get it. So then when you go in theater, which is distant learning in my mind, you then have to have memorized when I say this kind of a concept Here's the length of time it takes for it to land. So if you're starting off your career on distance learning, I don't think you understand when to pause and how long to pause. So for me, I, again, I do not compete with Michael Grinder Live. So when I set up my 90 minute programs, the first 50 minutes is one way. Everyone is muted. There's no interaction at all. Then once I get to the 50 minute mark, we take a five minute break. Then we come back with Q and A's. Q and A's, I'm still only gonna go to who's ever spotlighted, I'm not doing the group. So I cannot do group dynamics as well, so I don't even try. Let's figure out how to send the content that is so strong, so powerful, that they will listen to me, and then we can do Q and A. If I may, there's one other thing that's really cool. If you buy the idea of how do you come across as competent? Because that's what we started with. Number one thing, you've got to be competent, not credible. You got to be competent. So for me, being competent is you have to be intelligent. Here's what you're going to find. This is only for the people that are watching this. It won't work for the people that are just listening. If I communicate with my hands, and every time I talk, I move my hands. I automatically am having my hands be the Polynesian dancer that is communicating whatever I'm doing as I'm doing this. So if I say, there's a part of me that believes, I then slice off to one side of me, two hands. Then I wanna move over and do another part of me. If I take and fold one hand, bring it over and pop it up, fold the other hand and pop it up, I'm now doing what a street mime does. I'm creating phantom locations that people can associate with. You can do that literally and linearly in terms of your sentence structure. For instance, if I say, what I'm about to tell you, and I pause. That pause with a frozen hand adds credibility to whatever I'm about to say. But if I say, what I'm about to tell you is the single most important thing, you've got to have competence. That's so different than what I'm about to tell you. The single most important thing is competence. And then if I can, as it's called a pre-pause, is, and then I pause, then I say it, whoa, that's powerful. Then if I really want to do it well, I'm going to drop to whisper. And the single most important thing is competence. Then when I finish what I say, then I do a post-pause. So a pre-pause adds significance to what's going to be said afterwards. A post-pause goes in the long-term memory. But it's got to be based on your content. If you say, my name is, and you pause, that's not a good time to pause. They're wondering if you do know who you are. So just the pre and the post pause is one of the many things you can do, both in terms of in-person and distant learning that makes a very, very nice difference.
it's, it's funny just just on that line you brought up a funny memory in high school we had to do this uh english presentation and you were only allowed 100 words on your palm cards and the guy next to me he wrote like he, he used his real estate for words my name is zach it's like you've used four words on your name like what oh it was really funny um yes 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 the pause though is something we're actually uh and it's funny that you like, well, we can't do group dynamics. We can't sense it. So let's restructure it in a way where it doesn't matter so much. That's yeah. new to me. Because yeah. I, I think um, every conversation in, in BP and also the flip chart is like, how can I sense people? And we're all trying to offer advice to each other to help each other. Like, here's, here's some ideas and things that you can do. But you're saying, no, 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 restructure it so that it doesn't even become a thing. No, I'm it's not going to fight. I'm not going to compete against myself. If you are doing live, by the way, if you are doing live, and we'll see if this um, actually will work here. Uh, if I stood up and I was presenting to a group of people, if I have the weight on both hips equally, I preferably can see wider. And for the people at home, just try this. Just lean off to the side, look straight ahead and see how far you can see off to the side. Yeah. Then sit up straight and try to keep your head perpendicular to your shoulders. Because every time you do a flip chart or a PowerPoint and you turn your head and it's no longer perpendicular to your shoulders, you can't see as well. It's the actual amount of oxygen that you're getting inside that really makes a nice difference. So if I sit up straight, even in distance learning, I will have better ability to breathe and find words what I want to say next. Whereas if I, rest on the armchair or rest on the table, it just is not as effective. I may want to do that intentionally to have a different location for associated with a story or a concept, but please stay up straight. So rule of thumb, if you really want to be at your best, it's best for you to sit in the first third of your chair. Don't touch the back of your chair. Don't touch really? the back. Of your chair. Take the arms off your chairs. Don't be tempted to look at them, but keep a swivel chair if it's distance learning so you can switch from one side to the other side with ease. It really works well. So you want a swivel chair. It's like no one's mentioned the swivel chair. We're all talking about stand up desks and all like the camera and the microphone, but you've got to add that to our essential list. And I think, Mari, you're, you're standing up. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, round of applause. Uh, questions from the group, anything to, to follow up on that? No. Michael, um, when I first started coaching, uh, this is before virtual at all, and I coached one-to-one -one by phone. That was very much my first 15 years of my coaching. Um, I think and maybe you said it earlier on about your senses become more heightened because I could swear that I could actually appreciate body language to a certain extent because I would listen so hard. Does yes. that help us in any way with this virtual scenario that we're in where, where we're almost sensing from different senses, even though there are all the senses are in front of us, if you want. But yeah, yeah. Yeah. Do you understand what I'm saying? I've always, uh, before uh, COVID, my clients, it was always required to do Zoom or Skype. And I found no difference in terms of in person with that person as opposed to distance learning. Coaching is exactly the same. I, I get all the input I need because I'm only concentrating on one person. And like you said, Martin, your concentration is even greater. So yeah. now yeah. you can start going, if you wanna make a point, you just come in closer to the mm. camera and you talk. You have to make yeah, sure yeah. whatever you say, you can't blink. Because if I blink, it's a yes, but. It's broken. It's just, so my, my client base in terms of coaching has gone up with COVID. <laughs> Mine has. I'm available. I'm available. I'm not on the road. Mm -hmm. No, I think coaching one-on-one, -on -one, Zoom, absolutely the same and I think it's even better than in person. Why? The advantage of distance learning is implementation. Mm -hmm. Seeing someone every week, every three weeks, whoa, I could never do that live. It costs too much. Mm -hmm. Come on, let's learn how to take the advantages of distance learning and use it. 
hundred percent. Just on that. So uh, the blinking thing, I've never heard that before. I'm obviously going to have to start binging on your content, Michael. Ah. Like even in this conversation, I'm like, whoa, like the hands and the pause. Pausing terrifies me. I don't know. I've just got to like, yeah. Um, but, even but like, again, and it feels like it's it, longer on, online. Bring, bring your hands up by your shoulders. Okay, now say the same sentence again. Pausing terrifies me. Go ahead. Pausing terrifies me. You just slowed down because you're using your hands. Your voice pattern is different. What? We created, we created two different models. One is called the six wrong ways to uh, make a first impression. And it's on YouTube. It's two minutes long. It's called Michael Grinder's yeah. six wrong ways. It's just hilarious intended to be. But the follow up to that is seven steps to mastering presentation skills. And we actually have a product that gives that. What's amazing is the first four steps of the seven have to do with your hands, not your voice, not eye contact. It's just hands. You've got to get the hands. Everything starts with hands. Um, Leanne, Leanne Elliott is nodding because she's she's been a huge follower of your work. Um, Mari and Martin, I'm curious if you've had as much experience using your hands because like, and, and Michael, you watched my interview with, with Mark Bowden. Yeah. Like I just, I'm pretty flimsy with my hands. Like I'll, I'll use them when I'm enthusiastic. That's probably the only time I'll use them. It's like, I've got this idea, but then I don't intentionally even think about using them. Is it, is this a, I mean, how old am I now? 37. Is there hope for me? Uh, how long does it take to learn this skill? I'm, Sorry, I'm, I'm probably the youngest one here as well. So that was. <laughs> Leanne's waving her hands here. Well, what about me? What about me? I'm 78 if that helps. Yes, wow. yes, there's hope for you. Yeah. I didn't meet Michael till after I was 37. So you've got a head start on me already. Um, I, and, and Leanne, I would like to say that um, my hand skills have come such a long way. You know, um, reducing the noise in the message, making the message land when it's important, yeah. the, the pausing. Yeah. When I want to help people bring the group together and land something that's just going to carry them into a new, new realm of their competency, release their potentiality. And so, Leanne, Leanne, I'm kissing you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, Hands yeah, we're all signing up. up. Hands yeah. come into their <laughs> Take own. my money. You know, if if and and if I, I want to bring the group in, or I need to make sure that they understand that this is not negotiable. Where you have a contractual arrangement with your employer, this is something that you are going to do not negotiable you know and so it's it's um cha it really comes to life in the online environment because i said before i've lost some of my senses <laughs> i've lost my feet i've lost my stagecraft yeah. um i i've lost some of that being able to to treat the group like one living organism yeah. however in the online environment and i usually stand up as well i feel a bit constricted city uh, the hands make it work mm -hmm. and um, it, it is some of the those minute minute gestures yeah. that bring bring also bring that psychological safety bring that physiological safety into the room so I'm very careful about how I what I send down the camera how mm -hmm. I send it down the camera you know where I place the message that I'm sending down the camera, what I, I'm passing to them and the way in which I do it as well, so that I'm sort of replicating what I might do physically, but just with my hands. And, you know, it, it's one of those beautiful, beautiful little lessons that we can carry away with us. One, one of the things I've done is I've switched from when I'm in person with people, one of my hallmarks 
is I create emotional safety. And with emotional safety, you get to learn, you get to make mistakes, blah, blah, blah. I've switched a lot more when I do in, in, go into distance learning, same content. I go to intellectual safety instead of emotional safety. There's a difference. Um, yeah, intellectual, intellectual tell us safety. more about that, so the, the difference, yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm a fan of Brene Brown. Mm -hmm. And I would strongly recommend, please be competent before you're vulnerable. If you switch those, you're trying to go for emotional safety. If, if I tell you something that's emotional, but I'm not competent yet, then I'm seen, I've run the risk of being seen as weak. Mm -hmm. But if I come across as very competent and then I share, whoa. So please, intellectual safety, that you can agree or disagree with me, that's intellectual safety. Emotional safety, are you comfortable? We'll let you know when we're gonna take a break. So all routines would tend to match both intellectual and emotional safety. So make sure, post it, have some kind of structure. So that's why I've really gone to, here, print this out before our meeting and you're gonna fill this out as we go along. And then my PowerPoints will actually match. So you'll notice this PowerPoint is number three. Go to number three, fill out, I want structure. I want them to walk away. What did I learn? Because it's so ephemeral. It disappears. I will not try to compete with the stimuli of society. Please look at the social dilemma. It's huge. We live in an addictive society. Absolutely. Um yeah, and just it's funny, even with my mobile phone, uh, just on that, like you pick it up and there's your hand has a pattern of which apps it opens. It's like I'm not even thinking about it. It's like open this one and this one and this one. Um, yeah. It's absolutely addictive. Just um on the on the whole thing about the hand when, Le when Leanne was talking, then I was very much looking at your hands, Leanne, and seeing what you were doing. Um Michael, because you live in this space, when you talk to anyone, are you analyzing what they're doing with their hands? Are you if they're making a point and they blink, are you like, oh, there's something to follow this? Like, do you, can you switch that part off or are you constantly just analyzing like us right now, but also like people in real life? Um, th th there's several variables that determine whether I can switch it on or switch it off. Uh, if we pretend that we have a line called reality and below this line is reality, and above this line is the world of interpretation. You, you've got to be very honest with yourself. What is the connection for each of us? Because if you have all kinds of data, and I'm going to call you the um, medical forensic officer that appears on the criminal scene, you're only interested in the data. Now, data without interpretation is useless. But interpretation without evidence is absolutely dangerous. So we're walking a fine line. So you ask me, when I'm watching someone else's nonverbals, what am I doing with that? Boy, that is tough because you're gonna to have to go back to what level am I interacting with this other human being? Is it their appearance? Is it their behaviors, styles, value, and core? So as a presenter, as a leader, as a human being, you have two questions you ask yourself at all times, whether you're aware of it or not. One is, which circle of mind, appearance, behavior, style, value, core, do I wanna share? And which of the other person's circles do I wanna engage with? If you match, if you're doing the same level, you're fine. So if I may wandering off from facilitation, you with the people that you really care about, even when you're just calling on the phone, you're doing a Zoom, you're doing a text message, please open with, do you have time right now? Because if you want to share something very important, a value that was infringed upon during the day today, and the other person doesn't have time, you're going to mismatch. You're going to be talking to their behavior with your vulnerable values, and it's not going to go well. So time is the variable that determines the level of intimacy that you go to. 
Yeah, I'm even reflecting on that in terms of uh, when someone's come to me with something and it's like I'm not in that headspace to really accept it at that time and then could be seen as like, you know, ignoring it, but it's not the case. It's just I'm not ready to engage at that, that, that level. Yeah. Oh, I love it. And that's the beauty of facilitation, Michael. I find often uh, the things that work in facilitation will work in relationships in general. So, mm-hmm. yeah, it's, it's much more, broader than that. Um, any more questions for Michael? I think we've just been like this. I'm going to have to re-listen to this and re-watch it. Michael, you've got something to add? I'd like to end on something very basic I call the ABCs. Okay. So when you're going to communicate with another person, distant learning in person, please ask yourself, the A, how much attitude do I want to convey? How much behavior, Bs, do I want to convey? And how much cognitive do I want to convey? Now, what you'll find is those determine whether person to person works or distant learning works. Because if you're going to be a keynote speaker, you have 15 to 30 minutes, you're not going to be able to do all three. So go to attitudes, tell stories, tell the tragedy that you've had in the past. You almost died, get very emotional. That's all attitude. So metaphor and stories are the best way to convey in terms of A's. B's, if you're gonna do B's, you have to have a higher level of permission from your audience because they have to role play. If you're doing C, it's straight one way. It's the university professor that never looks up from his or her notes. And it's yes. just fine. So now you find, so the hardest thing I have in terms of distant learning is the bees. How do I do a role play with 50 people and I can't see what they're doing? How do I adjust to that? So if I may, the bees are almost taken away. Now I can do either stories or I can do cognitive. So for me, I do 50 minutes of every, every 90 minutes. It is straight one way. It's gonna be high, high cognitive. I'll sprinkle in stories because you gotta keep the emotion there. Then we'll go to Q and A, and now we go into more behaviors. Mm -hmm. So if I may, ABCs, figure out what you're trying to do. What's the best medium is the message that you wanna convey it on. And if I may, please visit House of Communication, Michael Grinder. Absolutely. I think a lot of people, you'll be getting a lot of hits to your website, um, myself included, just catching up on all of this stuff and and trying to make the remaining time on earth. What I've like just being more um, being more intentional with using my hands and communicating as well. I think um, you just get into a habit of the way that you, you have your style and to be what you've done today, Michael, it's, it's a big sort of pattern interrupter for me. And it's like, wow, I've got so much. Now I've just built my awareness of what's possible in this space. Yeah. Uh, so I'm really excited about that. Um, Martin said the, the, the number one thing for him that he learned from you was the impact of visuals um and, and and how we can create that contrast within space and using our voice even in a virtual setting I think that's very powerful and and thank you for saying that we can that there's actual absolute advantages for moving to the virtual world that, that we've got more time and we can, can be more intimate with people as well in terms of coaching so it's been absolutely delightful Mari says she's learned so many things myself included I'm my brain is still reeling so just so grateful to have you on the show and thank you so much for your time it's been great to chat to you today Pleasure, pleasure.